Hello. Good evening, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Thank you for being here. Hello to everybody at home. Hello, hello to last minute Doc Mansour arriving just in the nick of time. It's lovely to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Liz. I'm an editor here at Tortoise. And I have wanted to do this thinking for no less than three years. And given the fact that Tortoise was three years old on Saturday, it gives you some sense of how long this has been kind of in the works. It just took me a long time to convince James to let me do it. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to have the conversation. Um, we had a conversation that touched on some of the similar themes that I think might come up um, this evening um, at our Civil Rights Day of Thinkings that we did in, was it October time, 2019, something like that, when we talked about what happens when secular and religious rights clash. And we might get into some of that um, this evening. Let us start, as is customary, before I bring in some of our brilliant experts, two here in the room and two at home, with a show of hands. And feel free, everybody watching along at home, um, to post in the chat your feeling. Um, first of all, just let me get, give me a sense of uh, who went to a faith school. Raise your hands right up in the air. OK, so just a bit less than half, I think I am one as well. I went to a faith school. and. Um, the question, do faith schools have a place in modern education? Let's just get a general sense of the mood in the room. This is a question about which people have strong opinions. Who, generally speaking, thinks, yes, faith schools play an important role in modern education system? It's OK, you don't need to cringe. Yes, Mansour, yes. So who's hiding behind it? Lewis? Lola, it's a half hand. Why only a half hand, Lola? Can we get Lola a mic? Sorry. Thank you. Um, I think because uh, there's definitely an importance of having spaces that people can. May I went to a Church of England school, so and I'm I'm now not I don't practice any religion, but I feel like there is a definitely a credit to having a space that people can be together and have have share like a an equal sense of understanding if they've come from a similar background okay in a way that yeah so there's a sort of community cohesion yeah, aspect yeah. of it that you think is important claudia i feel like you, your hand was a bit hard <laughs> <laughs> um i think i've probably not thought about it enough being frank <laughs> which is why i'm here um that's why i'm here um i just think there is a place for lots of different things in modern education. It doesn't mean that it's the right thing. It doesn't mean that it's the wrong okay. thing. I just don't, I think, broadly speaking, I think there's a place for lots of different forms of education and that probably our whole education system needs <laughs> rewriting and an overhaul. Yeah. And within that, probably faith schools too. Um, but they're probably not so high up on my list of things that need Okay, interesting, interesting. So there's a sort of community cohesion here and there's an implicit choice element in, in some of the things that Claudia is talking about. Now, um, Mansour, nice to see you. Thank, Thank you for you being much. here. Um, you're not a teacher, you're an imam, but not a teacher in that sense, in a school sense, but you are generally pro faith schools. Can you just tell us why you think it matters? First of all, thank you. And uh, sorry for being a bit late. I'm a bit sweaty as well. Um, <laughs> Have you got a glass of water? I, I'm actually fasting right now. Oh, okay. So it's, uh, yeah, maybe in an hour. <laughs> but um, so I think uh, for me, faith schools are important because I would like my children and other children to have the option to go to a school where God is seen as important or where God plays a pivotal role. Now, that's not to say that everyone must believe in God. That's just to say that I would like for there to be a place where children can go in their education where God also plays an important role. I also think there's loads of, I mean, there's loads of uh, arguments on either side. I don't think we'll get into that, that right now, but maybe a little bit later um, about academic achievement. I know there's arguments on both sides of the coin there. Mm. There's arguments that morality can be decided in a, a secular way as well as a religious way. So mm -hmm. we'll get into that as well. But I generally feel that as a kind of an opener, I feel that God is incredibly important in many people's lives and I believe that starts from a very young age and so young people should have the option to be able to uh, be exposed to that and they should live in an environment where they can be theist and proud. Your um, 
did you go to a faith school when you were growing so up? So I, as an imam, I had to go to a school for seven years. It was not really a school. It was more, I, uh, it was, it's a course for seven years where okay. only members of my faith were there. So okay. in a sense it was, but it wasn't a at the primary age. It was uh, after Jesus. When you were little, doubles. did you go to a faith school? No, I did not. Okay, interesting. So the, the, I'm interested in that word, um, the option, that children should have the option to be able to go and be mm. fierce and proud is a good framing of it, actually, because I couldn't help but notice some of the body language of people who were sort of, did you go to a face? There was a little bit of cringing going on. And I, 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 I kind of know why that is. Sure. But, but, but the, um, as, a, as a child, certainly at primary school age, you really don't have a choice, do you, really? Your mum and dad pick where you're going to go to school. So it's not in, that In as much as your mum and dad will pick which country you live in and yeah. uh, your, your tax bracket or the language you speak at yeah, home yeah. or the kind of clothes you wear so yeah in a very similar way yeah yeah okay um interesting and thank you to the people already joining in on the chat we'll, we'll definitely make sure we have time to hear from you some of your education experiences and so on i'd love to speak to sarah hill now um who is one of our invited experts who i think has who's joining digitally there you are sarah hello hello hi <laughs> thanks so much for being here now the reason why why we wanted to um hear from sarah is because you have um it won't be unique but you have a very valuable and particular perspective in that you are a governor of a Church of England primary school, but yeah, you yeah. teach in a different primary school, which is non-faith school. And so therefore, you can tell us quite specifically what the differences are between them. Mm. Um, so I've just recently started working at a non-faith school in Portsmouth. And it's, it's a great school um, and I really enjoy it. But something I have felt is missing. And I've just I've really been thinking about it. And I think it is the fact it is a non-faith school. And I don't mean that in, in religious terms. I mean in the ethos and the values and the vision that the school embeds throughout the this, this school life. And I think that, for me, is really striking in a non-faith school because you it doesn't matter what religion it is, if you're in a faith school, you have that ethos, that Christian ethos in, in, in the school that I'm a governor at, which is embedded throughout the whole of the school life. And when you go to a non-faith school, that is somehow lost a bit. And I think that's that for me is really important. It's about the vision and it's about the values and the ethos more than anything else. Can you describe to us the values and ethos in the Church of England primary school? How do they how are they expressed? Like my kids, um, they, don't, they don't anymore. Actually, they're both in non-faith schools now, but they started off in pri the local primary, which happened to be C of E school and it was very much you know you can see there's the sort of rainbows on the wall with love and be kind mm. and it's all of that kind of governance what tell us how it comes to life in the school where you're I, a governor i think um just like the, the prayer before lunch just having that opportunity to to say thank you not necessarily to god but just to say thanks for what we're about to to eat um the 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 word the words they use um are all matched to uh phrases within the Bible, like perseverance, all things that you would hope that you could use in your everyday school life. But when you've got a link, I think it becomes a lot easier to embed it within the school. Does the, does the school that you teach at, though, not also have, they tend to, don't they, primary schools, they tend to have, you know, our school slogan is, it's normally inspire and achieve or something like that. Yeah. Does it not have that thing? Yeah, it does. So, I, I, yeah, I'm being a bit unfair there, aren't I? I? Yeah, absolutely it does. I think what I mean is I think it's a lot easier for a school to embed that um, in their teaching and, and their school life if it is there from a religious side, whereas it's a lot harder, um, which I've seen in the school I'm like working in Portsmouth, to really get that into um, everyday life. I think it's possible. And I think for me, that's the most important thing that we can all learn from a faith school is having that really strong ethos. As a teacher, so my son, when he was about six, I think, and as I say, at the time, was still in a local primary school, C of E, came home and said, in many ways, classic Sam, mummy, at school, they don't tell us when they're telling when they're teaching us the, the the truth or when they're teaching us the stories and i said how do you mean <laughs> and he said 
you know, that it's not signposted, that wasn't his word, but there's not a sort of, the teacher doesn't go, now we're going to do the thing where we talk about the Bible stories, mm. which, is a sto which is stories, versus now we're going to do the thing where we talk about the dinosaurs, which is real. And it wasn't clear, it was like, you know, he likes to know where <laughs> put yeah. the blue hat on or the red hat on or whatever. But as a teacher... In, an, in a faith school environment, because obviously you have to teach the national curriculum, but in RE or whatever you call it, you can say what you want. Is that not problematic? That there's no difference between what is doctrine and belief and what is true thing? Yeah, I, th I think it can be. And I think if you, I'm not particularly religious. I mean, I, we go to the church occasionally, but I certainly wouldn't call myself a, a you know, a, a real Christian as such. So when you're teaching, it's really important to say this is what these this religion believes. If you are a Christian, you believe this. If you are Jewish, you believe that. And I think it's a way the way you teach it, I guess. But yeah, I, I can see that is really tricky, especially in assemblies, if you're reading Bible stories and things like that. So yeah, it is it is hard. Mm, interesting. Mansour, what do you what do you think of that? I'm going to come to Alistair in a second. Of that sense of in a in a in a faith school environment, we hear from Sarah um, that there's it's perhaps easier to get a sort of coherent spirit, a sort of sense of the the feeling of the school if there's a faith sort of thread now hanging it together. Mm -hmm. But then you are going to, as a teacher, have to handle some sort of fairly nuanced differences between Absolutely. what's a, what's belief and what's other types of things absolutely no I, I agree and I, I don't think it's an either or I think they're both together in the same thing I think yeah. that uh, firstly I don't believe that it is only faith schools that can provide a, a holistic and moral viewpoint on life mm. I think schools are made up of the individuals that are there mm -hmm. my kind of and I'll go on to my argument a little bit later is more about rather than my, my point I should say is more about the fact that we should be able to choose whether we go to a faith school and we should choose whether we don't want to go to a faith school. That's more mm. my argument. Mm. What I do agree with is the fact that for me personally and for the people that say from my community, we believe that religion and God plays an incredibly important part in our lives. Mm. And therefore, an ethos which is shared both by the primary teachers, which are of course the parents, and the teachers that are in the school, when they share an ethos, that shared message uh, resonates better than an, an ethos which is only given from one side of the coin. Mm. On the other side, I strongly believe that there is, no one has a right to decide the religion of a child. I believe that there is a, a need and a parents feel the need that what they feel is right, they impart that on their children, but there should always be the choice in the hands of the children as well, mm. which is manifested usually later on, as is with politics, as is with a career choice yeah. and many other things as well. So I think there is a need for us to be in faith schools. There needs to be the ability for teachers to be able to differentiate between this is what I as a Muslim believe in and this is what I as a Catholic believe in and mm. this is what mm. I as a whatever else I believe in. Um, so I think that's a very important point as well. Mm. Interesting. Um, thank you. Um, Connor, just to heads up for you, I'd love to chat to Julie Bush, um, who is watching from home in a second. But first of all, I'm going to come to Alistair. Um, Alistair, um, is it Lichten? Is that how I pronounce it? Lichten? You're not going to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get it right. <laughs> Lichten. Um, anyway, Alistair Lichten is head of education for the National Secular Society, which oh. is a clue to his perspective on this question. Um, but, Alistair, we've heard, um, you know, some really thoughtful reflections on the, mm. the, the benefits, the considerations, the role of faith schools in the just sort of rounded development of children, in the, you know, good teachers, absolutely po possible to sort of handle the nuances mm. of the different types of information and, and thinking that you might be imparting. So what's the case against? Well, the case against organising public education around religion is the same as the case against organising public libraries, public job centres, uh, hospitals, etc. It's not a, a unique thing to religion. It's you know, it's a bit of an accident of history that, we've, that religious organisations have such a big role in this one particular area of public service, and they don't have a, in, at least in this country, they don't have as big a role in other areas of public service. Mm. Uh, there was really interesting interventions sort of popping off uh, the theme of choice, but is it okay if I follow up on, on the thing of, yeah, of yeah, ethos of and values? Now, 
I assume there's a good amount of religious and uh, belief diversity in the room. And if we were, any of us, to, to write down 20 words that describe our most important values to us, we'd probably agree on most of them. And in fact, if you, were, if you go and look at hundreds and hundreds of schools' ethos and value statements, whether they're faith schools or not faith schools, and you look at the words they use and the language you use, you will find that there is basically com or, you know, almost total overlap on all of the terms that, we can, that are sort of widely held public values. The only difference you will find is that faith schools frame those values in exclusively religious ways. And framing a value in an exclusively religious way is different in, to framing it in a personally religious way. I, I, this is, I have this value because I am this religion versus this value comes from this religion. And uh, looking at, and all schools have of these values, every school will teach kindness, tolerance, etc., regardless of its, its ethos. But faith schools frame it in this exclusively religious way. And this is, uh, this is a, a big problem. I've read it, church inspections of faith schools that will explicitly praise the school for promoting values such as kindness and tolerance, but criticise it for not rooting it exclusively in Christianity. That's how they inspect the schools. That's how they want the schools to frame this sort of ethos. Alistair, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, oh, a very good question um, asked on the chat from Andrew Good, which is, what's the definition of a faith school? I should have done that at the beginning. Yes. But we are talking about a very specific type of school, and there are sort of parameters and sort of rules about what you can and can't do if you are a faith school. So it's, we're particularly interested, I think, in state-funded faith schools, but not yeah. only. So just what, what are we talking about? So uh, I think most people, when they use the, the, the term faith school, and we should also recognise that faith school is in English and Wales quite focused. If, we were, if I was sitting here in, uh, sitting in Northern Ireland or Scotland, we might be using different terminology. Yeah. Uh, faith school is a description, not a legal designation. But, uh, because there are multiple legal designations. Schools can be designated as having state-funded schools, having a religious ethos, a religious character. They can be uh, religious, uh, they can be academies, voluntary aid, voluntary aid. There's, there's a wide variety of structural things, and there's big differences in their powers. So, for example, voluntary controlled faith schools will very, very rarely have discriminatory admissions. Voluntary aided faith schools will almost always. Uh, but faith schools, so faith schools is a... It's a generic term, um, and but my experience of speaking to people with, uh, um, if, if, if I'm wrong on this issue, uh, please feel free to come in. Uh, opinion. But my experience is when you speak to people about faith schools, even if they recognise that that is a wide variety of things it describes, mm. most people mm. have a general understanding of what you're talking about. I think so, yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't have a massive problem with that, no. Yeah, I think that's I also good. really like your beard, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a good bit. It's a good beard <laughs> off. Um, so, so Alistair, um, I, I interrupted you in your in your in your flow there. I, I was I was I was done on the ethos thing, but, yeah. uh, but I'm happy to. So, so uh, let's talk about the um, the sort of the, the wider case against. Um, there, there are some some of the things people say about faith schools. If I'm talking as a parent, so I was living in London, had my young family. Um, my son was just two, I just had my daughter. And so you start thinking, where are we going to send these children to school? And you look at the available options. Yeah. And option one is um, the really amazing, offset outstanding, non-denominational, non-faith school that everybody wants to go to and you don't stand a chance. Option two is the C of E primary school, which is very nice, but you have to go and pretend to be a Christian for a year and they check you off and do that whole thing. Option three, um, in our case, um, was a um, predominantly Jewish school that had a sort of preference for Jewish families because we lived in North mm. London. And, there. and option four was Grange Hill, sixth, sixth class entry, you know, terrifying and in special <laughs> measures. And so it's not ideal because I, a, a mm. lot of my sort of mum friends, you know, you have mum friends, um, they all did the thing where they pretended to be Christian for the year it took until they got the letter to say their child had got into that school and then didn't go again. I couldn't quite bring myself to do that, so we moved out of London, um, which is not an, uncommon, <laughs> it's not an uncommon thing to do. So the point about choice, mm. I think, is an important one to sort of re really, what, what do we mean when we say that? Because there are other elements of social engineering relating to faith schools 
indirectly, aren't there? Yes. Uh, I think the term option was used a couple of times in the audience, and, and, and you also use the term option and the term choice. And the narrative, the, the argument, faith schools promote choice, I, I understand that that does make an intuitive sense. That does seem yeah. to make sense. Uh, unpacking the reasons why that's actually a really flawed idea does take a little bit longer. Uh, I won't go hugely huge, huge into like, numbers, but we should say 20,000 families a year in England are assigned faith schools against their preference. Mm. Three in 10 families in England live in areas that face high or extreme restrictions on the option of a non-faith school. So those are kind of the factual problems with the choice narrative. But there are deeper problems because faith schools are public services. They are not products. We do not go into a shop and pick, you know, and we pick our absolute favorite bar of chocolate out of a hundred different options. When we come together to, to fund schools, these are public services. We're citizens, not consumers. Mm. Uh, so the choice, uh, and there's there's all sorts of choices we might like about Facebook, but I don't think anyone on the panel, okay, actually here's the experiment. Hands up if you think you should have the choice of a Labour Party and a, or a Conservative Party school. Be, only those two. Only those two, yeah. Those, those, those are the only two. So, so we, we don't think that that particular choice is important. I know which I'll pick, yeah. but that's a different <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but perhaps. We also uh, don't think that the choice of having an atheist school, is a ch that's not a choice that we applied. It's not a choice I think that any mm. critics of faith schools would ca mm. campaign for. The choice narrative also is, is and, I, and I, I don't know your views about uh, religiously selective admissions because many people, many people who are very supportive sort of faith schools still recognise the uh, how morally wrong and, and destructive discriminatory admissions are. Uh, many faith schools, but it, the cho choice of school interacting with discriminatory admissions is the situation you're describing. Mm. That do that doesn't that doesn't kind of work. So the whole choice narrative is. I, I, it's, simpl it's, it's, it's appealing in a simplistic way, and it's appealing if you've not, it, 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 because you have, we haven't considered the other choices, the factors that restrict people's choices, and also the other choices that we simply mm. don't have. Yeah. Is, is it discriminatory? It feels like it is, but there are laws about that. So how can it be okay if it's it is? Because we have an exemption to the Equality Act. So okay. uh, it is. It is just a factual matter that it is discriminatory. Mm. It is lawful direct discrimination. Lawful discrimination. Uh, there's there's many forms of discrimination which are which are lawful. If I if I were if I were advertising for a job for an imam, I would legally be allowed to say I am discriminating in this job and I'm going to require a bit of practicing wisdom. If we couldn't do that, it'd be a crazy it'd be a crazy situation. I'm sure you imagine. So there are areas where it is legal to discriminate against pe discriminate between people for provision of public services, etc. Uh, there is an exemption in the Equality Act which allows faith schools to uh, practice, to practice, have admissions policies that would otherwise be unlawful direct discrimination. And this is a matter where there is quite a lot of con uh, quite a lot of consensus across all religion and belief groups. Mm. It's uh, there are people who are very pro faith schools who are who recognise that discriminatory admissions is just, com is just completely wrong, that are, that are vehemently against it. We have criticism, you know, some people say that why don't you just focus on the discriminatory admissions because you would be able to build so many more connections, yes, so many yes. allies. And the point I would make is that we, we do. We, we work we, we work with uh, people uh, with a variety of views on faith schools around other specific, mm. uh, specific issues mm. such as that, and not just discriminatory admissions, but I just bring that up because that tends to be what many people see as the most egregious aspect of faith schools. Yeah. M Mansour, as, a, as, a, as an advocate of faith schools, mm. that, that distinction that Alistair's making between there's his, his opinion that there are other damaging aspects of, of uh, having an education that has faith in it, as separate from the specific issue with discriminatory admissions, could you, could you come to meet him on the discriminatory admissions aspect of it, even if not the other stuff? So I think, first of all, the, uh, the, the first argument does need to be looked at first, though. Yeah, go on. So I think the, a lot of the arguments that are against faith schools can actually be applied against religion as well, if you're so inclined, in the sense that if you say that 
because somebody has an education which is founded in religion, therefore they are intolerant, therefore they are mm. any number of things. Mm. You could make that argument about pretty much anything in life, mm. including religion in general. Mm. That because so-and-so person goes to a mosque or goes to a synagogue or goes to any number of things or because they vote red or blue or yellow, whatever other color there is, because of that, they are somehow divisive and they're intolerant to other people. I don't think mm. that's a fair example. I think the fact of the matter is that we all have our own preferences. And if we have the ability, no one's arguing for uh, the abolishment of um, state schools and there should only be faith schools. No one's arguing that. Mm. I think if we have the ability, and the question was asked whether or not we would go, we would like a, uh, a conservative or a, uh, a labor mm -hmm. school. I, I don't think that's, I think that's a, a little bit of a straw man argument because no one really equates the way that we are brought up necessarily to how we vote later on. If I was to say that, uh, and you don't have to uh, uh, answer on this, I might be proving wrong, you never know. Um, <laughs> the, if I was to say, would you prefer your children to be raised in a conservative, in terms of politics, or a conservative way, or one in a more liberal way, I think perhaps we would get more of an answer from the audience. Mm, so mm. in that way, I think that mm. the argument is more about if the choice is available, and you had the choice to send your children to a school in which you felt that they reflected the ethos that you have at home, would you do it or not? And I think the availability of those schools in this country is a phenomenal thing. You have the ability, and again, in the same breath, I understand and recognize the difficulty that parents have when they don't want to send their children to a faith school. Mm. And absolutely, they should have the option and again, what was the other word we used? Option and choice. Choice. Option and choice to be able to send their uh, children to a non uh, denominational or non religious school. And they should have mm. that choice. But that's not an argument to shut the faith schools down. Mm. That's an argument for more schools. Um, thank you, Mansoor. I'm going to bring in Julie Bush if we can. And then, Connor, after Julie, I'd love to hear from Viola King Forbes if she's still around. Hi, Julie. Hi. Can you hear me? Can we hear Julie? She unmuted. Can we hear you, Julie? Yeah, I am unmuted. Oh, no, we can't hear you at the moment. Can we hear you, Julie? That's, there must be a song in there somewhere. <laughs> no, no. Mm. Try again. Can we hear you? I'm... Oh, yes, there you are. Um, Julie, you were making some comments earlier in the chat about um, mental health and things like that. Just reflect, share with us your reflections on this conversation so far. But the, the point I was making was, in some ways, a wider point about generally um generally in life people in a in a fairly secular society yeah that people generally have lost the kind of mapping that religion gives them the kind of um their stronghold of wisdom and anchoring is lost when we become a secular society and i think that's a problem with everybody with adults and i think in schools um, I've always I've always said to friends of mine, what if they just taught mindfulness meditation, self reflection, resilience, yoga in schools, the world would be a very different place. And I think there's a there's a big mental health problem with our young people. And I think you know, face schools is one thing, but actually the idea that we that we don't teach children from a very young age self reflection critical thinking yeah rely resilience which can come from mindfulness meditation or whatever mm. we don't teach those things in school and i don't know why we don't teach those things in school because i think it would be actually quite helpful yeah. for children yeah um thanks julie i think julie makes good good points two thoughts i had when she was speaking first one is funny enough um my kids in primary school did have mindfulness sessions mm. every week and sometimes they come back and they say what they've been doing and I think, oh, my, what on earth goes on? <laughs> but they sort of, she, my daughter said, they sort of stand in a line and they sort of rub each other's shoulders right. and nobody wants to be the one at the back because <laughs> nobody's rubbing them. But uh, anyway, so they, they have had a little bit of that. But I, 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 I'm being for yeah, so you think, you think, right? They're forever in a circle in a primary school. I don't know. Um, but I know I'm being facetious to do this important point because I think it is a, an important point. Um, but the second thing is, I wonder if there have been any studies done um, on happiness or security or sense of well-being of young children in schools 
that are faith schools versus non-faith schools. Do, do you know of anything of that um, nature? I'm not aware of any broad population studies. There are, we, we know uh, some subpopulation studies. We know LGBT children are far, far more, are far, far unhappier in yeah. faith schools. Um, there is, and there's been a, a change over the last decade of an increased focus on character education, on resilience, on schools' duties to teach uh, social and, and moral development, etc., et mm. and all these things. And again, that that that's all schools. Uh, the idea that faith schools do this particularly particularly well or any unit, the only way they do it in a unique way is by framing it in an exclusively religious exclusively mm. religious way. And again, it's the framing it in the exclusively religious way. That is a problem. It's not framing it. It's not people framing it within their family or as an individual in an individually, individually, uh, re individually religious way. I would be interested on those sorts of studies um, of of happiness, uh, uh, etc. Across a, a broad school way, yeah. I think it might run into, and this is putting more my kind of researcher hat on, rather activism hat on. I think that would run into the same problems we get around these studies that try to show. Uh, you know, the, the mythical idea that faith schools perform better, there's a faith school effect in terms of academic performance, yeah, yeah. Uh, that going to uh, a, a smaller, more homogenous school might, uh, or, or, and, and indeed coming from uh, the, the social economic selection we see in many schools, coming from a, uh, a, a more affluent, a, a yeah. more affluent background would probably have a big effect. You'd be difficult to correct for other factors, it'll maybe. Be it'll, be mm. it'll be difficult to... to Correct for, for for other factors, yes. But that would that that would be uh, that would that would be interesting. And it, it goes to say when pe when people talk about the ca the character uh, character values and what and the values they pick in schools, they don't actually tend to mention uh, re uh, mention religious values as much as you you'd think. I, I saw a study uh, once, uh, and this is it's on our Facebook school research bank. I'm afraid I cannot remember the name of the study asking why Muslim parents wanted to send their kids to faith schools. And bear in mind also, not, not, there's, there's in no way do all Muslim parents want to send their kids to faith schools. Concerns over racism were a big reason yeah. why they wanted to send their kids to a school. Where they were safe. Uh, where, where they would feel that the the, so, the socially the, 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 the cultural background of the majority of pupils would, would be similar. So all schools can do better, uh, do better on all these yeah. issues. We, I just don't think there's any other area of public services where we think segregation is the problem. Uh, se segregating people by any sort of demographic is the solution to mm. uh, problems with com with with community cohesion between people. Um, I, I want to hear from Viola. I want to bring in um, Joshua. We have another invited expert who's got a particular, um, who's a. a uh, head of the governors at a big um, Jewish school, I think, in Manchester. Yeah. Um, but before I do, um, and I can see some hands up in the room as well. Alison, you, you mentioned, I'm sorry, I should have asked you this before. You mentioned um, if you are, this is a point of um, process more than anything. If I'm a, a C of E primary school, let's say, yeah. you mentioned a church inspection. So is that something, if I'm a C of E primary school, do I get a church inspection that's different and separate from my Ofsted inspection? Uh, is that yeah, like so a necessary all, thing? All, so... To be, act, uh, to be accurate, Section 48 of the Education Act requires for <laughs> faith schools to, to be to be inspected by how uh, how they promote their religious ethos, um, and there's different types of faith schools are inspected in different ways. So, for example, if it's a voluntary aided faith school or school that has the powers of a voluntary aided school, uh, their religious education is not inspected by Ofsted. Okay. Uh, their religious education, collective worship. Uh, relations and sex education, lots of things to do with ethos, inspected by the faith body. Okay. But all, but all, all school, all, all schools with a faith designation should legally be inspected by their religious body to ensure they're promoting uh, a rigorous religious ethos. Okay, great. Um, let's hear from Viola, and then I'd like to hear from Joshua as well. Hi, Viola. Hi. Hi. I was very taken by your comment in the chat about the binary view about teaching. Just talk, talk us through what you were saying. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I have a couple of slightly different thoughts related to it, um, and I think some have kind of been made before. One is the simpler point that I think quite a lot of people have put in the chat, which is just that, like, let's not suggest that um, you should send children to faith schools because they have an ethos that's nice for children to follow, and secular schools can't have that, because yeah. then you fail to challenge secular schools 
to step up. Instead, mm-hmm. you just put them in a box and say, you don't have that, these do. And then I guess people at secular schools might think, well, okay, that's not for us. And so and you, you see that across society. It's not just with faith. You see that with yeah. so many things when we just say, when we create a divide and say, these people have something, they're good, you're bad or whatever. Mm-hmm. People go, okay, well, I'm the bad person. I'm going to go do the bad thing then. Um, that's a sort of a much more um, reductionist way of viewing it. But the other thing I was sort of thinking, which is just a broader point about, you can make this about religion in general is, and I, I'm perfectly happy for anyone to say that their experience has been different but to me religion seems like something that is embedded in faith and faith doesn't seem like something that should be followed or held purely because it's convenient so it shouldn't be something that you just do because it's it's nice to have an idea of the afterlife because it's comforting or it's nice to um you know, you're just good because you have faith or or you send your child to a faith school because that will make them a good person. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of feel as if people should be good and people are people. And then also faith is about your relationship with God and um, we should all strive to be good, kind, loving people. Mm. And that doesn't to, to to associate that with religion almost undermines the religion and undermines people who are yeah. loving anyway because it's yeah. Yeah. So there's some kind of causative factor between the two of them. Yeah, yeah I, I understand the point um, you're making. Thanks, Viola. Let, let's um, chat to Joshua now, if you're there, Joshua. Joshua Rowe, who is chair of the governors at the King David High School, which is a Jewish faith school in Manchester. Hi, Joshua. Hi. Thank you very much for being here. And I'm sorry to have kept you waiting patiently while we've been no just quite a lot of people wanting to weigh in. Now, Joshua, you're, you're chair of the governors. Um, so um, not a teacher, but obviously very involved in the school. It's a secondary school. It is a primary school and a secondary school and a All nursery. The way through. And you have had a particular... Um, I mentioned at the beginning, we did a, a conversation about when s- secular and, and religious rights sort of clash. And you, your school has had a particular story with Ofsted over the past sort of four years or so. Just give us the sort of short version of, of, the, of the saga, uh, the saga so far. They claim, their argument was about discrimination between boys and girls because we got units which are in co-education and we've got single sex units all on the same campus. I'm talking about the high school now. Now, And uh, they didn't like it particularly, and they claimed it was an infringement of the Equalities Act. And uh, we went, took them to law, took them to the court, and uh, on the steps of the court, they conceded that they had misread the Equalities Act. And then hasn't it just happened again? That the, just the, happened again, yes. Uh, just happened yeah. again. Yeah. And and we're, we're dealing with that, yeah. Is the rationale for the for the next inspection? Ofsted happens. Is it every four years or so? Something like that. Yeah, um, the, the same the same uh, rationale that to to to, to downgrade the, the school's score, if you like. I'm not probably not using the right language. Is it the yeah, same the, reason for the for same the, kind of because of the distinct the, because of the sex dis, uh, segregated streams? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So that's a big part of it. Yes, they don't like it. It, uh, let's put it that way. I can't tell you what they feel inside, but the way with the impression we get is they're not particularly pleased with this model. Yeah. So is it your sense then that the Ofsted inspectors, when they arrive at the school and they spend their two, three, four days, however long it takes for them to do their, their thing, they score different aspects of the school's performance, don't they? They, they? There's different measures. Is it your sense that they arrive having already made their mind up because you are a faith school? Look, I've been through, I've been in this post for 32 years and I've been through some eight inspections and the difference between different inspectors is marked. It really okay. is. Some of them come with such a positive attitude and everything is fantastic and some come with an apparently negative attitude, and then everything becomes bad, however good, you're with me. So it is very much, it's very subjective. I find the whole offset process to be very subjective. There are no objective standards. Results used to matter until 2019, but now exam results also don't count for much. It's sort of a general feel of how you prepare children for life in Britain it is becoming more and more subjective. What I'm trying to say, offset some of the inspectors were amazing, and some mm. we have uh, 
more criticisms of. Hit and miss. And Joshua, in your school that you've been involved in for a, a, you know, three decades or, or more, um, is, it, is, it, is it solely um, Jewish kids that you have in your Not school? Only Jewish kids, yeah. yes, yes. And, and, and it's evidently a, a big school. You've got really little teeny tiny ones and great big enormous ones all the way through. Um, you, you're, just tell us what your school means to the community around you. Just tell us how you function as, as a part of the wider Jewish community in Manchester. First of all, it's a, it's a, it, it, amongst all the various things already said, most of which I agree with, by the way, it is a gift to the community, a community which wants the kids to be brought up in a Jewish faith. This is a particular gift. And it's someone was asked, uh, speaking earlier about the fact it could be considered discriminatory. And I would say the reverse too. If, Jewish schools or Muslim schools or Catholic schools weren't allowed, that would be discriminatory. You with me? There's two sides mm -hmm. of that coin. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is it's a gift to the community, the ability to bring up children in the way they want them brought up. That in itself is a sort of a positive. Mm -hmm. And secondly, and the more importantly, perhaps, is the content of the religion. And by the way, listening to the previous conversations, I think that it's absolutely right to say that so many schools have got the right values about honesty and kindness and integrity and resilience, but those all emanate from religion. They all come from the Christian, Jewish, Islamic religions, all of them. We sort of, perhaps subtly without noticing it, we're actually all running faith schools or faith values. Some emphasize it more than others, but the value system comes from the same place. So in a big, big way, putting it in a big way, what the school like ours does, it, it gives parents that choice and it strengthens the community sense and we believe and i think most faith schools believe it also gives kids so much of that content that good content which you can have in a non-faith school too absolutely but it mm. really reinforces it so the kids grow up with a sense of duties not just rights with a sense of all the things we mentioned earlier great things and also for us it's important that kids have the knowledge of the faith and tradition and religion and uh, someone said earlier about biblical stories just being stories and everything else just being real. But to us, the biblical stories are not about the story, it's about the message. And the message, which is the message which has created what I call this great country, all the great things that have come, have emanated, have come from these lovely, lovely and great teachings. Thanks ever so much. Um... Joshua, there's a few hands coming up in, in and around the room. I would like to speak to, so if you had your hand up earlier and Luke um, had your hand up and Phoebe at the back. So let's just try and get some responses. Hi, so. Hi, I, I think we keep talking about choice and we keep talking about discrimination, but we've already kind of discriminated because we're talking about state schools. And I think for me, one of the huge things is that our education system is a product and we do think of it like consumers, because there is that there is that choice, and not for all people, but there is that choice of, do you go to a state school or do you go to a private school? And for people who can't afford the private schools, it's, okay, well, within my lot and within my catchment area, what which is the best school? And often, that's not, it's not necessarily based on exams. I think, it, I think you're right, it is, it's discrimination. It's whose parents are willing to lie to get you into church school. Um, and I think there's, you can't have this conversation without having a wider conversation about education mm -hmm. and saying that we're failing both faith schools and non-faith schools mm. because we are already allowing discrimination in other areas mm -hmm. of education. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we just say that we don't like discrimination full stop and that you know you can go to whatever school is on offer and that might be that they teach, you know, Islamic teaching or Christian teaching or Jew, uh, or secular teaching, whatever. That that's the kind of that's that is the choice. But I don't think we're actually talking about a, a choice necessarily. I, I agree that the, the choice is illusory to to, yeah. to, to, to in, in many in much of it anyway. But the the. Um, when I mentioned to, I feel like I've said this already in the thinking, forgive me if I'm losing my marbles, but when I said to my former colleague here at Tortoise, Chris Cook, who was brilliant on public policy, and if he was here, he'd be, you know, bursting it to, to join in. Um, I said, um, what's the deal with faith schools, Chris? And he said, ah, the whole thing is we can't afford not to have them. 
And so mm -hmm. to, the, to your point about, you know, why don't we just even everything out, mm -hmm. get rid of private schools while we're at it, it's a free for all. That's when the money conversation comes in. But Alice, mm -hmm. you're not convinced about that. No, uh, can I make a, uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to kind of make a very small point about the, the, the previous school in Manchester. I, I, I think it's fair to point out that problems with unlawful sex segregation and treating uh, female uh, pupils in schools uh, less favourably are not are problems in only a very small number of faith schools and we should not be used as the anyone's main argument against faith schools. Uh, the money issue is a practical issue because we want, you know, we suggest that we want to transition from a, a faith-based system to a non-faith-based system. What, and those are details, and it's unfortunately it, it's it, it's more complicated than that. The suggestion, so around a third of schools are faith schools. The suggestion that the state would have to buy those schools if they were non-faith schools is this kind of ludicrous suggestion that I just I, I I'm, I've quite baffled where it comes from. These are schools that are effectively entirely publicly funded. Some small capital contributions here and yeah, there. Yeah, it's but, like 7% it, or something. Uh, yeah, and in capital contribution is, 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 a very, is a very small part of mm. just of running schools. Mm. These, are, these are often, yes, there's the, 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 often you have a religious trust owns the land and the buildings, but often those land and buildings were sold to them like, by, by the local authority for a pound or leased to them for 100 years for a pound. Uh, the idea that the ownership issue is the defining and that that's an absolute barrier, it, it, it just doesn't hold out. If we had that attitude, then we just say, well, you know, the, the, all the, the whole country is owned by the Queen originally, so we, can't, <laughs> so we can't change any laws, we must be an absolute monarchy. Um, the trans, no part of any sensible transition from a faith base to a community for the education system would in any way require the state to buy the land and buildings that it already effectively uh, almost almost entirely funds. There may be uh, negotiations that need to happen. What I imagine would happen is you, the faith-based trust would continue to own the land and buildings. Uh, they could be, uh, uh, their ownership thing could be taken down percentage every year as uh, in line with their capital contribution declining. But really it would just be a matter of you own, just because you own the underlying land, the school is publicly funded, so we, we decide right. that. It, it's somewhat analogous to, uh, you know, lease, I'm, a, I'm a leaseholder, uh, some management company owns the land, owns and something I like that. I pay, pay ground rent. Pound. Yeah, how, uh, what's, what's ground rent a year? I think £10 a year. Yeah. But uh, you know, they don't decide what goes on inside <laughs> inside my house because of that rather archaic fact that you know they happen to own some plot of land. Mansell. Just, just a point on that. So, I mean, that's a lovely argument. Um, I think on the on the flip side, uh, and I mean that genuinely, it's, it's a good argument because I think it, it very much appeals to people in the sense that it does seem when we put words in like archaic and things like give an argument that like the Majesty, Her Majesty owns all the land in the world, therefore she, all the land in the UK, and therefore she can all the dolphins as well. I heard swans. <laughs> anyway, swans are bigger, right? Um, on the flip side of that, though, I think that let's make it in a really much easier way. I mean, if you had a phone which you happened to buy for a pound, then I said, actually, I deserve that phone and I should have that phone. And your, your rights, what, are you just going to give them up? It's something that you own. If the Christian church, and of course I'm a Muslim, I should say that um, when we were deciding, I've got three kids, well, hey, eight, five, and two. When eight, number one, was, uh, yeah, number one was uh, trying to go to school, or indeed he, we were trying to get him into school. Uh, he, wasn't, he was trying to stay at home. Uh, we were preferring to send him to a Church of England school. Mm. As a Muslim imam, I mm -hmm. wanted my son to go to a Church of England school because mm -hmm. I enjoyed and I appreciated the ethos of the children that were there. Mm -hmm. Compared to, I, I wasn't thinking, where's my local Muslim school? Mm. I was looking at a good school that had a good ethos, and the one that I found happened to be a Christian one. Mm. And I thought, I'll send my son there. But coming back to the argument about the... Uh, the state schools and who owns the schools. A lot of these churches originally, when they bought the land, they had the initiative to provide free health care, uh, free education to many people, yeah. much before the government did. Yeah. They had the initiative to buy the land, to build the property. Same with hospitals as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. So they built this property with the, with the concept that we're going to provide free education to children. 
and then that uh, establishment was taken on a different way and there was, there was dealings with the church and the state mm. of course but right now we can't be taking those buildings away simply because of the fact that it doesn't suit our own personal ideologies. I, I, I agree that the, the mobile phone quartet is not a perfect it's not a perfect analogy, and that's a bit of a rose tinted view of history because you know the religious religious order system did play an important role in developing universal public education mm. with that all along funded uh, supported by and funded by the state and also while. For, for large parts of the history, unfortunately, I mean, the national, the, the Church of England can point point to uh, his historical good record in the Catholic education system as well in providing schools for poor, for for poor children before we had state education. We now have state education, and also, who was it that you know really fought against the development of state education? This isn't what we disagree on, though, is it? We d this is a very really personal moment. <laughs> we, we, you know, like, you, you're, you're pro faith schools because because of the reasons uh, you, you've. You, I think you 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 uh, have some maybe misconceptions about the academic, uh, academic performance. You've got a, a, what I view as a quite simple, simple, um, simplistic view of choice. But that's, that's your, 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 your view of choice. Our disagreement is about that. Our disagreement is not about the technical details of peppercorn rents and uh, and and, and etc and it, who and the and the, the, gov the governance of, of trust that's not what we disagree about mm. is it that's uh, so and if you if 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 i if i change my mind on faith sco safe schools mm. it wouldn't be about this and if you change your minds on on the faith schools it wouldn't be about this issue this issue this this issue of ownership it really it, it it's a distraction it's not something that has held back uh, how about any other sort of thing where we've decided that we need to fund for society rather than having it in, part, in private ownership? Alison, so the, 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 it, it may be a dis, it's distraction of the fundamental of the argument, but it's an important practical consideration for us as a newsroom when we're trying to figure it through. So I'm going to bring in Luke, if I can, because you've got the mic and I know you want to weigh in on this. That, thanks, Liz. Um, I, if it's all right, I'd love to backtrack yeah, um, quite a bit absolutely. to what uh, Josh, Joshua, Joshua said, yeah, but also yeah. I think you raised a point that alludes to it there in saying that um, you felt it was right to send your uh, child to uh, a Christian school, despite that not being the major revealed world religion to which you subscribe. Yep. And I, I think partly because you found the, the, uh, the ethos and the values, and the phrase was used there, yeah, the ethos, values, and vision of that school to be appropriate. I think that's interesting because what we risk in saying, as Joshua did, that those values emanate from world religion is excluding every other person who doesn't subscribe to a major world re religion from the group of people that can hold those values. And, and what I mean by that is anyone who either believes that what the major world religions we have today, Christianity, Islam, um, have an, a deeper, more ancient origin in a much more multicultural and diverse history that we can see in the archaeology of regions like the, the Middle East, the, the, the Levant and South Asia. And what, what we're, we're risking, I think, in assuming that those values emanate from the present world religions is that there are people dotted around the planet today and overwhelmingly in marginalized communities who are, don't have access to those values, don't have access to the, that ethos and couldn't possibly run a school or another institution at which in, in which those ethos, the, that those values and visions and mm. ethos would be at the heart, and I think that's a, a very dangerous proposition. Um, and I don't think we've got a perfect alternative because there are problems with, for example, the, the European Convention on Human Rights, which you referenced earlier, and and uh, other forms of international law that get used often to try and instantiate an ethos and a vision and values mm. for people who don't hold a major world religion. But I prefer a framework that was non-exclusionary from its basis, mm. if you understand mm. what I mean. Mm. Um, so I, I think that statement's a dangerous one, that values like kindness, compassion, uh, all the ones that appear in the, written with the yeah. finger paint in the schools, yeah. they emanate from world religion as it exists today. No. I, di I disagree. Yeah, thank you, um, Luke. It's, it's sim sim Luke's articulate similarly to, to the point that Julie was making. Um, Fees, I know you wanted to come in. Um, I'm, I'm mindful that um, Agatha has put her little flag up, so we, we're, we're really already quick. out of time. Be really quick, and then really, um, I'll try and really do a sum quick. up. 
I think I'm surprised that this conversation has been so positive. I feel like we're talking about the positives of secular and the positives of faith school. And like, I, I really think we need to say like there are some significant negatives and it might be specific schools because we're talking very broadly about religion and, the, and these groups of schools, but there are specific actors. So I'm thinking specifically because you reminded me because of Chris um, and he posted back because his mum was on the board of the school oh, yeah. where the Southwark um, diocese like, stepped in and kind of said we shouldn't have this author come and teach and they quoted the fact that the Equalities Act gives them the right to do so mm-hmm. and I, I when those kind of actions happen and people are using kind of this this weight of a church behind them to kind of justify things like that 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 has a significant a- a impact on a, on a gay child at that school they are, they're being told that this is an, an issue rather than having these kind of open conversations so I think it is important to like remember that in the context um, and, and as a, a small point I'd be interested to know about universities and how this kind of moves on to university spaces because when you finish school you, you go somewhere else um, and I'd be interested to know like how those kind of setups these ethoses can translate into that space um, because from what my understanding it, it didn't really and I think that would be a good space to look at that happiness and the outcomes from being at these faith schools as well. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much um, Phoebe. The time has whizzed by. I feel we scratched the surface for, for thinking that was three years <laughs> in the making I feel like we could do another three hours to get to get anywhere but there are some there are some important things that I think we can think on and possibly um I feel like this is one we could take on the road um as taught us we don't just do thinkings here in the newsroom but we are now now we're allowed to anyway we we go out and about um and have um done thinkings in places of worship mosque um big fancy cathedral and and other places I feel like this is the sort of conversation and in schools that we could take out on the road and get some different perspectives from Mm. some different people as well for for me um there's a few things I would say um um in in summary as, as points to reflect on to um Joshua's experience in Manchester at the King David High School um, it would seem to, and to a point that Elizabeth um, has posted in the chat here, Elizabeth said, I've witnessed so much prejudice against faith schools to the extent that I would never take any notice of Ofsted's report. In fact, a poor Ofsted might well be a sign of a good individual school. Now, whoever is right in this scenario, if there are people who are feeling that Ofsted, for whatever reason, are not giving an accurate readout on the performance of some schools... On for what, well, however true or not true that suspicion might be, we've got a problem with Ofsted. Now, there's nobody from Ofsted here today who can respond to that, but it feels to me like that is a useful question for us to ask. And then the second thing, um, I dug out the readout from the thinking that we did about um, secular and religious rights, and uh, this was what we said, and it feels to me to be a good summary of today. Um, Freedom of worship is an uncontested right, but people with religious beliefs cannot use their faith as an impervious shield to block out the secular world. Sincerely and deeply held religious beliefs should be respected, but they do not trump the views of people motivated by their political or identity-driven principles. And it was Reverend Lucy Winkett, who's a good friend of Tortus, rector of St. James Church in Church of Bidley, who neatly summed up that as the UK is a secular state and not a religious one, religion should be about persuasion and not coercion. That seems to me to be... Um, a good summary. Um, there's a lot more thinking that we can do usefully on this topic. Um, and I want to say a big thank you to Alistair and to Mansour and to Sarah, wherever she may be, and to Joshua up in Manchester and to everybody who's contributed. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And this is not the end of this particular one. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.